Hey, hey, welcome to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am Amy Fearman. Kristen is off this week and I am going to be sitting down and having a conversation with Nick Cox, who is a student of ours who has been on quite a journey in his Amazon space. And we want to bring him on and talk to him about that journey so that you can be motivated to take steps in your journey as well. All right, Nick, you can come on on. Let's have a conversation and talk a little bit about your Amazon journey. There he is. Hey. Welcome to the Amazon Files. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Nice to have you here. Um, so all of you can hear, Nick has a little bit of an accent. Um, Kristen made the misstep of saying where he was not from when we were at the workshop <laughs> earlier this year. Um, and so tell us about your journey. What has brought you to where you are right now, sitting in Queens, New York? Sure. So not from Australia. <laughs> I'm from New Zealand. So I'm born and raised in New Zealand uh, from Wellington, which is the capital city. Um, so probably most of my life there, although it's sort of, you know, the longer I've been in New York, that sort of transitions. But um, I, I went through my, you know, grew up, I went through my schooling in New York. I attended university and I started my career in New York as well. So my first job was there. Uh, I also lived in Australia. So I have lived in Australia as well. I did a, an 18 month stint in Australia um, on my way through to New York. And the move to Australia was, um, it was a bit of a lifestyle change. A lot of New Zealanders moved to Australia to, uh, to try different jobs, to have a bigger sort of life experience. It's, it's a very similar lifestyle, but it's a, it's a nice change in pace as well, a bit more up tempo and more opportunities as well. So it was kind of like an indefinite move. Um, but I was only there for 18 months. So I think it's it was nice. about six months after being in Australia. I was in Philadelphia, so you know, close to home for you. And um, I met a New Yorker in Philadelphia at a training course. We worked for the same company. And fast forward about a year, I was uh, living in New York. <laughs> Followed the woman there. It's kind of an amazing story because it's interesting. We we don't think in the U.S. about going someplace to get different experiences because we have such a plethora of opportunity for different things and all across the board. And having to think to go to a different country to get a different opportunity and then to even take that even further to across the pond to the U.S. and having being able to and for those of you who don't know Nick yet, and you're going to get to know him in this conversation, his brain has more ideas per minute than most normal people. He always has the next three or four things planned before he's even started the one he's working on right now. And that's just how he functions. So you said you came to Philly to do training. What was your degree and what did you do? What was your job? What did you do before this? Yeah, so when I, when I started at university, when I first signed up, I thought uh, accounting. Accounting was what I was going to, to do. Wow, I never would have guessed that. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed math at school, so I was sort of you know, a numbers person. Uh, so I thought that would be fun. And before I even started, so between the time of signing up and first starting, I changed uh, to computer science, and information systems. Another and, uh, using of numbers, just in a different way. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I, I maybe saw where the world was going with you know, everyone talked coding now. So I was doing coding university so I sort of got in the earlier phase of that um, so that was where I started and when I left university it was the economy in New Zealand wasn't so good so job opportunities were not that great so yeah when you're looking for jobs as a graduate there weren't that many opportunities and I fell into PricewaterhouseCoopers um, great place to start a career um, I didn't go down the accounting track which is funny but I still ended up in an accounting firm uh, but my my work for the first few years was uh, IT related consulting and internal audit work. So going into our clients and reviewing processes end to end, uh, reviewing how they use their technology and systems to to enable those processes. So sort of seeing a lot about how businesses work. I can totally see how that benefits you going forward, being able to be inside and see the inner workings of 
a variety of different companies helps you see what would be a good thing to do and what would not be a good thing to do. Yeah. And the benefit of, of being in New Zealand and somewhat in Australia too is companies are smaller. So when you go into consulting work, just you tend to see more of the company. You're less specialized. And so I, I sort of refer to myself as a, as a specialist of being a generalist. So I looked at systems, finance, accounting, manufacturing, anything you can imagine. You're and then trying to help. Industry-wise, across the board, financial services, uh, companies that make soap, pet food, cars, all sorts. All sorts of product-based businesses. Yeah. So you really had your mind in that space even before you started selling product on your own. So. Right. We go from this space over here where you're in other people's businesses, seeing how the back end works, helping them make decisions and put processes in place. How did you make the shift from doing that to now being an Amazon seller? Yeah, so there was a sort of a, a phase in between okay. then and now. So when I moved to, to the US, uh, I was still doing the consulting work. And you're sort of, because of the market you're in in New York, it tended to be more financial services oriented so to me that was less interesting you know we're talking about products versus uh, financial products so they're not things you can touch not tangible so there was less interest for me in that kind of work but also um, that was a tough work environment as well so uh, I had to it was 2000 2019 so 2017 I needed to, to make a, a change a, a big change in what I was doing so I quit my job just, it was a long time coming, but I just quit the job. It was, it was time for a change. And, and for me, I, I'm in something 100%. So um, I was looking at what I wanted to transition into when I left that job in financial services and decided that Amazon was the place to be. So it was 100% of my effort going into that. One of the things I've noticed about you, and even in our conversation, is you're always looking forward. You saw that accounting really wasn't it, but coding was where it was at, where the trend was mm -hmm. going. You did the same thing with Amazon. You saw what Amazon is, the direction it's going, and you said, that's where I want to be because that's where it is right, right now. And yeah. th that has benefited you going forward. And that's a lesson to take away is to always be looking forward, not always just where you are right now. Because as we all know, <laughs> in business and in Amazon, the only constant is going to be change that's for sure yeah. uh, and i know that even in the past couple of years since you started on amazon you've experienced what amazon change is like there's been tremendous change in those two years yeah it's it's kind of amazing to think back when i started this eight years ago and what i did differently then to what i can do now and a lot of that has to do with the landscape changing amazon changing the number of sellers changing, the spaces and categories being more competitive or gated or brand restrictions. There's so many changes that you have to always have your foot kind of out the door onto the next thing so you know when a change comes, whether, okay, figure this out or what's next. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've kind of figured that out. So what is it like, I know that Amazon just started in Australia, a year or so ago. What is it like being in this space and seeing it starting to come to the world where you were for part of your, your career? How does that, what does that look like differently? It's interesting. So the, the, I mean, the New Zealand and Australian marketplaces are not too different to the US. Maybe uh, less choice okay. in the market, higher prices because of all the shipping export import costs as well. Um, but what I like about the markets down there is they're also world leading in their own way and that they have products first. They, they create new products and inventions as well. So I always have my eyes on those markets for, for again, keeping up with trends and what might ultimately land on the shores here as well. And having Amazon open up there gives another uh, window into what's happening down there as well. So I find that fascinating. I haven't myself put my foot into the market and, Amazon in Australia, I, I, I'm not quite ready to. You've been on Amazon for two years. Even in those two years, what is the biggest shift that you've seen on the Amazon marketplace? Yeah, it's, it's something I think about often because it sort of dictates then, you know, how we, how we move forward. Uh, it's, it's still being 
flooded by a lot of sellers coming on, some with great intentions um, to do good things and, and be part of a good community, and then some who are not quite as nice um, in their ambitions. And I think Amazon's, to a certain extent, working with us to to change some of their processes and, and, and protocols to help weed out some of those difficult sellers, but they're not doing enough for us. So I personally have had some challenges in my business as a result of some nefarious actors <laughs> on the on the marketplace, which is tough. Um, but you can see that they're, they're, they're trying. Amazon's such a massive marketplace and so complex that things aren't gonna change overnight. Yeah, it's kind of like a, trying to stop a freight train on a dime. Like it's not possible. Yeah. It's like having to look and, and it's more complex than being like, we just need to stop this from happening because that impacts so many things. And we've oftentimes seen Amazon change something and not necessarily realize the repercussions until they've put it in place and had to pull back. And yes. so that's part of what we're dealing with with them is we see changes that need to happen. They put something in place that we see like, what are you thinking? Why did you do it that way? Well, they don't see it necessarily from our perspective always. And so that's always part of the challenge is yeah. we need yeah. to be able to give them feedback. They don't make that part of it easy. Um, but as we've learned, and I know that you've learned is Part of this is part of being able to sell on Amazon. It's their playground, and they're going to do it in the way that they see fit. And either we go with that, and we adjust our businesses to work with that, or we decide that maybe Amazon isn't the right marketplace anymore. Yeah, and I, I you see it in some of the the Facebook groups. Um, uh, they're really trying to push private label and and trying to just to, to inform sellers that you can start tomorrow and earn, you know, enough money to buy these fancy cars. <laughs> and it's, it, it brings uh, false hope to people as well, which I think is unfortunate. So the, you end up with a marketplace of, uh, it's quite messy because there's a lot of products that go up there and then never sell them the, the catalog and they, they remain in the catalog. Um, so I think that's a little bit challenging for, for those of us who go out and do research to find what we want to sell. It's, it's a, it's a, just a difficult place, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm all about constant change as well and, and, and you know, looking ahead and trying to navigate the way through that. I think that, that gives you the opportunity for competitive advantage because if you find methods and ways to, to play in that space, you can benefit from that. Absolutely. It's a great point to bring up because so often people hit a wall and hit hard and if you can do the research and figure out a way through it that your competitors aren't willing to put the energy and effort into, you're ahead of the game. You're, you're winning when they don't know how to. And so that's a really good insight into being yeah. able to do that. So let's bring that forward and let's talk about how implementing a business model like Wholesale Bundles helped you navigate some of the muddy waters that have been part of your Amazon journey so far. Yeah, so where I started was private label. Uh, I, I guess I did see wholesale as an opportunity at the beginning as well, but the, all the literature and videos I'd been watching were more private label focused, so that's where I started. And I had some capital in, to invest, so I was able to go down the private label path. And I started off with one product. It's a, it's a toy product. It's, it's still selling today. Um, it's still my most successful product, which is great. And um, now with Christmas coming, it's especially a good time to have a product like that. Um, so that was great. I had a few other private label products that didn't do so well. You learned some lessons. Um, but the, the, the challenge with private label is you invest so much upfront in time and, and capital, and then you can wait two to three months before it arrives on the shores and then into Amazon, and then you've got to do your marketing and get it selling, and you don't recoup any money for quite a period of time. And that's if you're successful. If you're not, then you've got to try and liquidate somehow. So I've, I've seen all of that. Um, so I've, I've, I've enjoy, I enjoy creating products. I, I like being creative. So, so I enjoy the private label side of things. But um, I wanted to expand the business. So I was looking for not only ways to fill my time, because private label, you sort of do it and then you sit um, a little bit. So what else can I do with my time? So I learned about wholesale and I've... Um, pretty quickly, actually, it was sort of been within three to six months, I started doing wholesale as well and got some great supplies and you know, had 
many, many SKUs, and it was great. Um, but as you can see, I live in an apartment, and there's limited space. And with all those boxes coming through of wholesale products, there's sort of limited space, and got a family lives here with me as well. So, but they don't want to live in a world of cardboard and packing tape walls. <laughs> I have a five-year-old son, so he, he's kind of happy playing in the boxes and with the tape and all of that, so that's kind of been fun. That is very true. My kids always wanted to yeah. make towers out of all the cardboard boxes that we had. Yeah, I have a storage unit down the road as well, so I've been able to manage, and it's, it's been a good way to grow the business, and I've learned a lot by doing that. Um, but space is an issue, and then time is an issue as well, you know, getting all those products through. And I, I used to sell a lot of grocery, and hot sauce was one that I specialized in. Um, takes a lot of time. You've got to, you know, with the packaging requirements, you've got to bubble wrap every bottle. It takes a long time and takes a lot of space. But it was really lucrative. But I had to do it myself because the margins are at a level where you get someone else to do that for 50 cents to a dollar. It's not really worth it okay. anymore. So I wanted to see what was next. And there's been times in my life, like when I left my, my job to start Amazon, that I sort of do a, a, a 180 degree turn and go in a different direction. And I've sometimes I have to hold myself back and say, don't do that. Just go a 10 degree turn and do something slightly different. And that's where wholesale bundles came along. And, um, you know, I saw various courses and videos out there. I obviously came across you and Kristen as well. And uh, I thought, yeah, this is something that could be interesting. Um, it takes my creativity. It already leverages some of the wholesale I already do. And then there was an added piece that came later on about outsourcing as well. I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Um, but the ability to to free up my time to spend on looking to the future while having other folks help me prepare the goods to send off to Amazon has been a great aspect of the business and brings back some um, less chaos to the apartments as well, which is great. And that's, I'm, I'm sure your family thoroughly enjoys the fact that there is a little bit less of that chaos. Um, I know that in my own life, when the prep center came in, it was a wonderful change to not have all of that. Not only in the sense, I can't imagine being in an apartment and having deliveries and having to get boxes to UPS and all of that stuff. I did it from my first floor here and you're doing it from multi-levels up in the sky. And that's amazing to me. But what I'm hearing you say is not only did wholesale bundles fill the gap with your private label, it's also allowed you to be able to find a way to get it out of your space, to be able to not be doing it yourself. I mean, grocery, any grocery product that you're selling single item, there are very few that have high margins. I mean, grocery stores yeah. themselves have a 12% margin. Um, and so it's just a really hard when you're doing single unit wholesale to compete in that space, especially with Amazon fees. And so seeing that transition, both Chris and I made a similar transition from grocery into what we do now because we saw a similar thing. And that's part of the evolution and change. Now, wholesale bundles, how long have you been bundling in the two years that you've been on Amazon? The, you know, there were some bundles that I was doing maybe a year ago. Okay. Not necessarily because I was focused on bundles, but because in my research of good wholesale products to sell, I saw other folks or, you know, multiple sellers selling bundles. And so, for example, it was um, various art materials that came in different colors and they were put into a, a poly bag. I didn't think bundle at the time, but that's what I was doing. Uh, but more consciously, uh, really the last six months now. And what do you do differently now that you are doing it consciously versus when you were just kind of seeing what other people were doing? What do you do differently with that? Well, the key thing is, you know, I'm creating my own bundle and my own listings versus hopping on other people's, bund bund you know, bundle listings. Um, I, the, the good thing about wholesale is you can see a, a product out there that's selling well and there's a, uh, the way I see it is that you, you got the, the, the pie, you take a slice of the pie when you're, you know, sell on another listing, or well, why not take the whole pie? I um, love that idea. Right? So, and so that's sort of um, where I went with that was to, to, to own that. Um, but also then all the research that goes into it. So rather than looking for um, something that's already out there and copying it, I'm spending the time looking at what the market actually wants with the keyword research and, and all that good stuff and, and putting the bundles together that way. 
Now we've talked, you've mentioned research time and time and time again in this. Um, you've done it with your private label. You've done it with wholesale. You're doing it with wholesale bundles. What is it about the research for you that is key to being successful as a seller on Amazon? So it's both a strength and a weakness for me. Okay. Um, I'm a very analytical person. So a lot of my work doing uh, internal auditing consulting was very much about analysis. So you've got a business process and you've got to determine whether it's effective or not and are there any problems with it or you know, can they improve it? So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of spending too much time, sort of the, the analysis paralysis sometimes. Um, but I can manage that. <laughs> the, the, I mean, the good thing about it is the, the data is available for us to look at. And there's good tools out there to use like Merchant Words where you can, you can have it you know, very easily accessible and, and um, pretty logically, you know, using keywords search for everyday things. It's, it's, uh, it's great to... I've lost my thought. <laughs> Well, we were, we were talking. We were talking about um, the evolution, but it's it's interesting to be able to know that you have all the tools out there. I mean, especially somebody like you who has gone through the analytical part of understanding businesses. It's the same type of thing that you do to analyze a product. Um, is this a good fit? Can this? And what are you using to make that happen? Merchant words is a key to what we do. We, I mean, mm-hmm. you've learned that. Um, yeah. It's, how we find to be able to make decisions. And so often we see people either jumping on other people's listings or struggling to bring bundles to market because they aren't utilizing tools to be able to find the data that they need to say, yes, go, no, don't go. And that's part of what our framework helps people do is being able to give them that step-by-step to say yes or no, does this make sense at this point in the research journey? Keep going or move on to something else. Yeah, and that's what I like about the, the process. I'm obviously, process oriented guys. So I like repeatability, and the, the 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 bundle framework helps take you step by step to maybe end up with a good result and maybe not. But that's a part of the process. I I think if you get to the end of the the framework and you decide not to pursue a certain bundle, that's still a success success because you've you've done the analysis, you've done it properly, you've decided maybe not now, maybe it's not the time for that, and maybe you park that away as something to come back to later on because maybe the market will change or maybe you'll leverage that into a different kind of bundle. So it it, it just makes sense. And I want to highlight a point that you just made there is just because you get to the end and say, no, this isn't a bundle to do now. It's just like going through and doing retail arbitrage and scanning an entire shelf only to realize that Amazon carries all of that and they sell it for less than what you can buy it at retail. You know that you don't have to do that or you can come back and look at it at a later time or you can find a way to do it differently or you can find I've done this before where I'll have that idea in the back of my head it didn't work with this supplier but I come back and oh my goodness here's a similar type of product from a different supplier that's 50% less and I can actually make a profit doing that same type of bundle now yeah exactly it's building your knowledge bank Um, And you have a very interesting knowledge bank because of your analytical background, because of the job you held before. It's, I can understand the stuck point though of wanting to overanalyze. What is something that you do? Because I know that you're not the only person in our audience who gets stuck with that overanalysis. What is your, okay, I'm just going to do it. What is, what do you have to do to help yourself get through that analysis paralysis? So there's a few methods I use. One is um, I, not only am I still doing wholesale bundles, I still have a, an eye on private label as well. And that's, I have some ideas I'm developing for 2020 in that space. So I just change the activity I'm working on. Okay. I, I get to a point where I say, okay, um, I'm spinning my wheels. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not getting anything productive out of this. Let me put that aside for now and try spending the next couple of hours on the other activity. Uh, maybe because I, uh, the, the private label products are, are, are game related and there's a lot of aspects of strategy that go into a game. So it's good to take breaks from that as well. So I go back to it and say, well, how do I feel about this game today? Do the rules make sense? You know, does the, the position of the game make sense? And then I sort of maybe get stuck points on that and I change back to something else. Um, I'm, I'm very careful not to flip flop between things too quickly. It's a very conscious effort to, to swerve between 
different activities. And maybe some terms it's, oh, my son's coming home from school now, I've got to go pick him up from the bus and let's go and play with the ball in the park as well. So it's trying to clear my mind from, from, from the, the, the struggle, I guess. This is the step point, wherever you're stuck, is sometimes that stepping mm -hmm. away for doing whatever it is, moving on to something else, playing with your kids, just going and reading a book, going for a walk, whatever it is to clear your head. And that's a great insight to be able, because I think so many of us will just think, I just want to push through it and get to the answer. And pushing through isn't always going to get you to a positive place. It might end up getting you more and more frustrated. And we want to be able to make that shift. So giving yourself that time away. I know that oftentimes I want to just push through and find that answer and it is better to step away because how often have I know for me it happens I've walked away and then I'll be off doing something else and I have an aha moment that goes what if I did it this way yeah exactly it's, it's and that, that, as you think back to my time at university doing computer science you know computer science is about logic and solving problems and you'd often get stuck points there as well and, and it, it, it might be you're at a, a party or somewhere else, focusing on what you're doing, where you are, but all of a sudden the idea sparks in your mind and you have to write it down or, or note it on your phone. But yeah, it's, it, it, it really helps to change between activities. And I'll, I'll go back to the point I made before as well, that um, if you've gone through the, the framework and you end up with a result of not implementing that bundle, that's still okay. So that's not a stuck point. That's actually the end of that path. Stop, go back to the beginning and start again on a different idea. And I think that that comes back to how we do business in general, not just with bundles, but how far have we gone along this journey and maybe this isn't the category we should be in anymore or being able to make those adjustments. And that's going back to the beginning of our conversation being able to make those adjustments and changes as you go along. Um, not feeling like I sell grocery. I will always sell grocery. Heck, I wouldn't be doing what I do now if I still sold grocery. It's amazing to yeah. see, and it doesn't have to be an all or nothing switch. You talked about that. Sometimes our brain just goes, I just want to push this all away and move on to something else. And sometimes it has to be a transition. So, okay, we're doing this. 80% of the time, we're going to make a shift. Sometimes we don't have the opportunity to just dump everything and move into something else. Maybe you want to start bundles and you only have time to bring one to the market. Well, one's better than nothing and it helps teach you the process so that the second yes. one and the third one and the tenth one become easier. Yeah, and you know, both you and Kristen talk about the knowledge bank as well, which is, which is a great place to start, you know, leverage what you know. But sometimes it's okay to go outside your knowledge bank or expand your knowledge, knowledge bank and, and start looking at different categories as well. What is, you don't need to be focused narrowly on one. You don't need to have blinders on? It's Not all the time anyway. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's good to have that focus and we encourage focus, but if focus is getting you feeling like you're stuck, go, okay, go through the process. Say that didn't work. Go on to something else. That's totally okay. Yep. As long as you follow the framework through so you're not bouncing all over the place, it helps you get there. Now, how many, how, what, approximately what percentage of your business right now is wholesale bundles? It sort of goes up and down. Um, uh, because it's leading up to Christmas with my private label product, that's more than 50% of my sales right now. Uh, typically, it's, it's 30 to 50%. Okay. Looking now, to, to grow over time even more. How many SKUs do you, st on average, do you have with your private label? Because that's one product and it's 50% of your sales. So that's that. But how many other products are you managing on top of that at this point? At this time, about 30. Okay. Uh, if you asked me earlier in the year, it was close to 80. Okay. Um, what made a, the shift there? Um, a number of different things. One was, you know, the conscious effort to to shift away from, for example, the hot sauces. You know, that would have been twenty to thirty SKUs just there. So reducing that has had a big impact for sure. And there's also been the fun of um, having some wholesale products where they sell really nicely, and then the, the manufacturer or the you know the, the representative comes along and says, mm -mm, "You can't sell anymore." Not because I did anything wrong, but just changing their business model. Yep. And that's led to quite a, a reduction in number of SKUs as well. Have you found, what is your uh, steps going forward? Knowing that that can happen at any time, how are you managing your business going forward to know that if that happens, what is my game plan? What is my plan B? What is, what is my direction now? Because you've experienced that. What do you use your yeah. change going forward? 
Yeah, so it's the, this would have been the, this year has been a bit of a ebb and flow. Yeah, where uh, every month I've grown in certain ways, you know, that could be new bundles or taking on new suppliers. And that's been great. But then these other things that have been happening sort of chip away at that growth. So it kind of ends up being kind of a little bit flat over time, which is, which is, you know, fine. Um, but ultimately I want to have it continue to grow over time. So I think that's one of the other lessons about this business is you may start with some great products, whether it's a private label or wholesale bundles or, or an other, um, you can't rest on your laurels and stop there because something will happen, which will make it harder for you to, 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 to maintain that. So you need to be looking at what's coming next all the time. So I'm, I'm always looking for new products, new, new suppliers, new opportunities as well. Um, it's, it's ongoing, it's, but that's the fun. And it's absolutely... I don't, I, don't want, I don't want it to be constant. Right, it's a wise thing to do to be able to make those, to, to always have that looking forward because you never know what's going to happen. You never know what thing is going to all of a sudden trend out or what manufacturer is going to no longer be around. And that's also why we totally encourage people not to have all your eggs in one basket is as far as manufacturers and going wider and have more of a breadth. I mean, anything can happen. A private label product can be doing well for years and then all of a sudden the demand completely changes because who knows what came as a competitor to that that you'd never mm -hmm. anticipated coming. And so being okay. able to be mobile and agile to be able to make the shifts when you need to be um, is really, really essential. Now, I know that you've taken our courses, you've attended one of our workshops. What has been the biggest asset that you've gotten out of the teaching the pieces that you've taken from us from our podcasts and whatnot that's helped you move forward? Yeah, so um, there's a few things I would, I would name. One is um, maybe this is not what you maybe expect, but community. More than the, the content, it's the community that, that comes along with it. So, um, you know, that, that you and Kristen are accessible um, to a large degree through the, the Facebook groups, as an example, or through the trainings. And, and just, uh, you know, being a part of a community of very like-minded individuals. We're all very different in what we do um, our backgrounds, but we're all interested in sort of growing and becoming better in, in, in this business. So that's, that's been great. Um, for me, given some of the, the business challenges I had and, and during the year, mostly around hijackers, it was, it was also about um, regaining some confidence. So, you know, I'd, I'd gone through the, I did the framework training online, which was, which was great, but I felt like I needed to have an in-person experience as well to, to, to go through the, the process you know, with your mentoring in the room to bring my confidence back. Um, and that, that definitely paid off. We're glad. And, and one of the things that we've found, going back to the community aspect that you mentioned, is not only in the Facebook community, the hub, but also being in that in-person environment gives you a connection that you don't get when you're behind a computer screen um, and being able to be in that space and having interactions with other human beings is a wonderful thing. And, and we're glad that you were able to participate um, with us in that to be able to experience the community aspect of what a workshop environment is. I mean, that's part of why we built it the way we did. It's not us sitting up there spilling information at you. It's everybody working together to create a bundle. Yeah. Yeah, and the and the and the, the information you, you give is it's real it's real, it, and it makes sense. It's logical. It follows a, a structured approach rather than the flashy bells and whistles that you might see in other groups or programs. So it just feels real. We appreciate that. Um, that's our goal: is to always be authentic and transparent with what we do because we're still in the we're still in the thick of it with you guys with what we do yeah. and wanting to always know that it's, when we're going through things, you will find out what we figured out, what we didn't figure out and understanding that. And that's all part of this is being our authentic selves as we go through it. Now, I know that you've been trying a lot of various different things in various different ways to bring, bring products to the marketplace. Um, <clears throat> what are you excited about in the next 12 months? Is that growing Amazon? Is that testing something else? What are you looking to do next? Yeah, I, you know, we talked about this a little bit in, in the workshop afterwards. Um, I, I, I enjoy what I'm, what I'm doing, 
um, with the business overall. And it's, it's, to me, it's not just the products I sell, it's the business process. It's having the ownership of the business, which I really enjoy and the flexibility that brings to, to my life, my family life as well. So that's all great. Um, but what I feel like I need to do more of is um, I feel like I want to put more of me into what I'm doing. So rather than reselling the products of uh, other manufacturers, I want to be designing products. So that steers me back you know, towards the private label side of the business. Um, I want to use some of my creativity to create products, get out to the market, got a few ideas that I think that people would like. So that's going to be a big focus of of next year. I'm just having to, to manage my excitement of not doing too many at the same time. Um, and you know, sort of having the, the notebook to the side with a few things listed for the future. But um, So that'll be a big part of it. Um, but also I, I realize in this business you need to take a really balanced, mindful approach and not put all your eggs in one basket. Um, uh, I, w I, I guess I'm gonna maintain one aspect of that, which I, I don't plan on looking at other marketplaces yet that will still be an Amazon focus for next year. So it'll be private label, but also growing in the bundle side as well. That's something I want to do a lot more growth. In. So you're going to keep yourself balanced, which is another thing to listen in on is, is to making sure that when you're growing your business, you are finding that balance of all the things and not jumping into focusing all your energy in one thing and letting other things slide. We see a lot of students do that in Q4 where they jump out of what has been successful for them all year to jump into something new and exciting. And you end up finding that all those evergreen items with other products you've been selling all year still sell during Q4 and sometimes even yeah, more so. More. Yeah. And so letting them slide is not necessarily in the benefit of your business. So being able to do a balance of both and I like the, so the managing your excitement. I, I feel you on that one because we always want to jump into the new thing because it's exciting, it's shiny, it's new. But you also yeah. have to find that balance of both. Yeah, and you know, one thing I, I don't do that many sellers do around this time of the year is I don't do seasonal at all, and I never have. And I prefer the evergreen side of the business. And like you say, if that increases during Q4, wonderful. If it doesn't, I'm okay with that as well. Um, it's just a way of managing my business that works better for me. I don't want to be doing lots of little short-term projects. So this will be good for Easter. This will be good for Halloween and so on. If by chance my products sell more during those times, that's wonderful. But I'm not going to focus on that. And that's an interesting thing because we can manage it both ways. We can uh, do it based on seasonal or not an evergreen. I've learned over the course of my time, and I don't know if this is something you learned the more you do it, seasonal is easy to do in the beginning because it's short term. In the long term, evergreen feels so much better because I can sell it for 12 months of the year. And there are times where it's better and times where it's not. And I think that that's something that each of us has to determine for ourselves what works best is to do I like seasonal or do I not? Some people want that constant creative change because selling the same thing, it's boring. Yeah. And for you, you're taking that in a different way into changing and channeling it into your private label. Now, will you bundle your private label? Will you pull that into your private label aspect as well? Yes, uh, to a certain extent. You know, where it makes makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that is very common in the, the games world, yeah, card games, board games, is expansion packs. Yep. So that's a bundle opportunity for the future as well. Um, I haven't gone far enough down that path yet to know for sure, but it certainly, it certainly is in my mind. It's just a part of what I do now. So yeah, it's something I'm always thinking about. And it's interesting because whether you bundle or not, it's always something that's part of how you think now, because you can look at something and decide, is it bundleable? What's the bundle bundleability of that item, as, as Kristen yeah. is always saying. So what is it possible? Is it not? Does it make sense? But it's also something that you're thinking about. It's that mindset shift that you've made to look at your target audience a little bit differently to say, do they want it as a single item? Do they want it as a bundle? Are, there, are both of those avatars out there? Do both of those people exist? And I'm solving a different problem for different yep. people. Now, you are a very active member of both of our communities, both the Facebook community and in the hub. I know that one of the things that you expressed to us is that you want to have that community. We've talked about it here. We talked about it at the workshop. And knowing that you're not alone in that, that there's a lot of people out there looking for that community of other sellers. What can you encourage people to do to 
bring them, bring a seller community around them to help them move forward? I think one thing that is common in many groups is lack of sharing and re even real sharing. And what I mean by that is um, people kind of try and keep it high level, you know, um, and, and don't really talk specific to their challenge or concern or, or objective. And I think if you can be real about what you're trying to achieve and put that out there, I think that encourages people to respond to you. And, and likewise, you know, people, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your kind of concept. People just naturally help each other. So, um, but also people are always concerned that their ideas are going to be stolen or, or someone's going to do something bad if they give out information. I lean more in the direction of try and share a bit more information um, because you're going to get better help as a result. So I think, I think people who, who go out there wanting help need to, to, to be real about what they're looking for and, 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 and then open-minded to what feedback they're getting back. We, we all ask questions with sort of preconceived ideas of what the answers would be, um, which is okay, but be open about what you're going to get back as well because maybe you're going to get information you've never thought of and I think that that's a really interesting point is being able to put it out there because you don't know what you're going to get back. The whole idea of preconceived notions is like, well, if I put this out there, they're just going to tell me this. And in reality, you're going to find by talking to other people, maybe somebody's in the same situation that you're in. Maybe they have a resource that you don't know, that you've never had access to. Being able to be open and sharing things is great. That you know, We see that in the Facebook community. We see it in the hub in spades when people are asking specific questions about what it is that they're trying to accomplish and do. Um, whether it be, I have these keywords. What keywords am I missing? You know, things like that. Being able to ask, this is the problem I'm having. Not, not highbrow, not, not highbrow is the wrong word, but um, high level it and being too uh, not clear enough as to what your problem is. You want to be able to get help. You need to find the people you can get that help from. And I know there's a lot of intimidation in Facebook groups of feeling like you're asking a dumb question. And we really try to encourage yeah. you to ask any question that you have because there is no dumb question. Because if you have a question, in order to move forward, you need an answer. And we want to help yeah. you with the answer. And you've fostered a, a very warm and loving community where if you don't have something good to say, you don't say it. And, and that's, that rule doesn't hold in many other groups. People are sort of attack sometimes. So that's, that's, that's one thing that I love about this group is um, you know you're going to get nice responses. And that is very true, and I appreciate you saying that. And it's something we've worked really hard to build over the past five years as a community that is open to supporting each other, not beating each other down. Um, because you're going to get further by being nice to each other than you are by being nasty and mean. Um, and, and so not, It's not just on Amazon, that's in life. Yes, right. very true. Um, you're going to take yourself farther by being kind to somebody because you never know where that kind gesture for somebody else is going to come back to you. And it, it may not be right away. It may be six months down the road, but it's always surprising when those little bits of help with somebody comes back and say, Hey, I found this and I thought you'd might, you could use this or something along those lines. It's, it's a real positive to have community with other people. And this business can be very solo very confined to I'm sitting in front of a computer all day, every day. Yeah. And we want that interaction. And yes, on a computer is not the same as face to face. It never will be. It will never take that place, but it's one step closer than being shut into yourself and just your computer. Um, whether you're an introvert, an extrovert or whatever it is in your space, trying to find if it's one person or if it's multiple people to have some kind of a community and finding the community that works best for you. If you're in communities that feel harsh, don't stay. Walk away and find something else that works better for you. So thank you so much for joining us today, Nick. If you guys want to have more conversation with Nick, Nick is very active in both our Facebook community and our hub community. He has a wealth of knowledge on various different fronts um, and he's open to sharing. We've seen a lot of him saying, I just want to tell you what this experience I just have. And he'll give you an entire list of what just happened and what he did with it. And that's the kind of people that we want to have in our group so that everybody can learn from each other. 
Um, so thank you so much. Now I'm going to say I completely forgot to do my join us card. If you're not part of our Facebook community, <laughs> head over to mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word Nick so that you can get in our Facebook community. I don't have my pretty little card that Kristen always has because I'm not Kristen and I don't have all the cards. I even had a note here that said Nick Cox code word and I didn't do it. You probably can't uh, see maybe, but in the window over there, there's, there's about a hundred post-it notes on that window just there. That's awesome. So it makes me go wonder what they're doing with all of their post-it notes. What are they doing? It makes me think of yeah. Kristen and all of the post-it notes. Um, thank you so much. If you know, we are here to support you, we are here to support each other and we look forward to continuing the conversation, helping you grow your journey over the next coming months and years. Mm -hmm.